Um, so we are going to conclude this article that we've been in for a while. Um, we may get it done a little earlier. Maybe. That's kind of like the Bible Institute teachers that I used to have. I don't know if Pastor Burden was one of them. But they used to say, we may get out of here a little early, and then like 10 o'clock, you're like, <laughs> falling asleep. I don't know if Pastor Burton did that at all. That's right. He used to. He used to be. We used to have one of the, the teachers that uh, <clears throat> he was, this was many years ago, Pastor Neff. How many of you remember Pastor Neff? And uh, we used to be sitting in his class, and he was notorious for, for notes. And your hand would cramp up and, you know, just seize up. And, and uh, um, I think one of them, I think it was, uh, we used to uh, tease one of the students about just asking him a question so it would kind of get him, kind of get him off his train of thought to kind of slow him down or something like that. But he would always say, like, letter one or number A, and you were, like, trying to take notes, and you're, it was just blistering. And, uh, but he was, he was a good teacher. He was motivated. So we won't do that. I won't force you to take notes. But we are going to conclude this. Um, the last section he has in, his, uh, in this article, and again, this article is embedded within another book um, that you can get online. Uh, yeah, you can go to his website and get it. Um, I'm having a hard time remembering the book name of the book. I think the church that will stand. The disciplining church. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, go, go peruse his website. In fact, you know, we're dealing with, with uh, the Internet. I want you to turn over to book of Daniel, chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Daniel is a very good book in understanding uh, um, how the end of days will happen, um, the significance of the nation of Israel. Um, if you've been taught uh, that Israel is not significant uh, or a major part of end times prophecy, if you've been taught that by some church, some individual, some person on the Internet, um, that's wrong. That's right. that's it's, right. called, it's called Reformed Theology. Um, or replacement theology, rather. The idea that the church has replaced Israel. But, in fact, according to the Bible, Israel and the church are two distinct things. <clears throat> um, uh, the Old Testament, uh, a lot of people think, well, because I'm, I'm, I'm in the church age and I'm uh, a believer in the New Testament, the Old Testament's not important to me. That's not true either. The Old Testament is very important because it is the very words of God. And he would not have... Uh, miraculously preserved them for us um, were it not important. Um, there are, um, I mean, the history, the poetry, the prophecy uh, of the Old Testament is extremely important to us. Daniel chapter 12, as, uh, as Daniel's book is concluding and he is being given uh, prophecy, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the individual, uh, I believe it's angel, might be the angel Gabriel, I can't remember offhand. But anyways, he's concluding this prophecy that he's giving to Daniel. And he says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, uh, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Um, and I want you to just notice that the character of, of the end of times or the last days is going to be uh, an increase in knowledge, not necessarily... Not necessarily knowledge that, that helps us in, in our relationship with the Lord, but there's going to be an increase in knowledge. I want you to look over. Um, let me turn to my notes here. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Paul giving us some characteristics of the last days here as he's writing to Timothy, young preacher. He says, this know also that in the last days. So um, he's speaking in reference to the last days. He says, perilous times shall come. And then he gives the nature of it. Um, do I want to read all of that? Yes, we'll read all that. We'll read through verse 7. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, as we read through these, 
is this matching what we're going through right now? Just, just think about it. Uh, of your interactions with, with folks, um, even in local churches. Uh, but, you know, folks out in the world says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Now, it's given us some direction here, too. It's very important. Don't hang around with them. It says, from such, turn away. Leave the world behind you. Okay? If you notice this, get away from it. Um, run from it. Flee. Um, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is, um, I would say, a very accurate depiction of the present world. And also of that last verse, um, there's plenty of people out there that are always looking for knowledge, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They always want to know something. Um, in fact, I think if, hmm, let's, let me see if I can find this. I'm looking for the passage where Paul, ah, here we go. Um, he says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit, I'm in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, if you want to go there. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. We're going to read this. This is, this is pretty good. Um, Paul, on his missionary journey, he says, uh, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with, devout, with the devout persons and in the market daily with them and met with, him, that, with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Some, other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know thereof where, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Okay? Um, and then it goes on, it talks about how Paul um, noticed a altar that they had uh, um, made, or it says, for as I passed by, I, I beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. It's kind of like that person who keeps the, the lucky rabbit's foot. Um, hopefully you don't have a lucky rabbit's foot on you. Um, or some kind of, you know, like the, you know, the Virgin Mary on the dashboard, or some, something just, just to kind of cover your bases. Um, but they, they, they had an altar to the unknown God, and he took that occasion of this unknown God and preached Jesus Christ to them. And at the end of it, <clears throat> he did, uh, he said, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent, to turn away from their former beliefs of what they were holding to, whether it be idolatry, uh, some polytheistic version of gods. It could be anything that you hold to, um, you could be like myself, where I didn't believe in any particular God, but I called myself a Christian because I was in the United States. I kind of thought, oh, I'm a Christian, I guess. I, I, there's a Bible in my home. There was a big white Bible, Catholic Bible in my home. Sat on the bookshelf for a long time. We were a godless family. And I was, I was brought up in a public school system, taught evolution. So I essentially kind of leaned that way. Um, and I, that for me, I didn't have to, to turn away from false gods as much as I had to turn away from humanism um, and this false teaching of evolution, and I had to reject that, and I had to turn to God and call out to him for salvation. Um, but that is a principle in the scripture that repentance is very important, and, and the preaching in the, in the Bible calls for us to repent. When John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, 
um, that believing on him entails a repentance from a former belief. Okay, so we have to take the whole counsel of, of, of the scripture uh, because there's people who are teaching out there that repentance is not necessary for salvation, but indeed it is. Um, you cannot come to Christ until you turn away from your former self um, and your former beliefs. It's not God plus something else. One of the things that Brother Cloud deals with in um, Nepal is this idea that they want to add Jesus onto what they already have. And he has to teach him, no, you have to reject everything else you have and embrace Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by him. <clears throat> Anyways, back to this idea of, of increasing in knowledge and that men uh, uh, will increase in knowledge at the end of times and that they are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth, that they're always entertaining some new ideas, uh, in fact, I was just uh, here. I just heard this speaker, this humanistic speaker, talking about we have to have dialogue, and we have to. We can't be compartmentalizing ourselves. And people generally tend to flock. You know, birds of a feather flock together. You know, um, so we have that. You know, he was he was saying we 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 tend to do that whether we recognize it or not, but, but that we shouldn't do that. Um, I kind of think it's good to separate. Um, when you know what you believe and you believe the truth, you should separate from error. Um, otherwise, you might become a part of that error. That's right. And the world is just clamoring and, and uh, screaming at the top of its lungs for everybody to just get along uh, and unify. Um, you know, we have to be careful about uh, this idea of unity. Okay? Unity is a biblical thing. God wants us to be unified. He got, God wants the body of Christ to be in unity. Okay? But that does not mean we give up biblical truth for it. So if you're standing for biblical truth uh, and, and you're inside of a church that's teaching error, you have to you have a hard decision to make. You have to separate from it. Um, okay, I keep getting sidetracked with that, that idea. Um, I want to read something to you in regards to this idea of knowledge. We live in a time uh, of exponentially increasing knowledge. Um, <clears throat> it, is, it is with good cause, this is not from Brother Cloud, this is a, a separate, um, I can't remember the name of this gentleman, but he, uh, he says it is with good cause that the term information overload was coined in recent years. If the amount of information that is available is an indication of the knowledge available, knowledge has increased within our generation almost beyond imagination. Um, I think the Bible says in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? So really, really biblical truth, and I'm not saying that, you know, in mathematics there's absolute truth. Two plus two is four, unless you go to some other kind of school where it's just the journey you're going on. Um, okay. Um, but, I mean, when there, there is knowledge out there that's, that's just not profitable. Um, but if you really want the truth and you want a life full of purpose, then you're going to begin with God. Um, trying to get purpose, trying to, trying to find purpose in life be, with outside of your creator is just, it's a foolish journey. Um, here are just a few mind-boggling facts on this. Um, the total amount of the world's newly generated digital information is expected to ex have exploded by 60% to 8 exabytes. How many of you have ever heard of an exabyte? Never heard of an exabyte. I've heard of terabytes, hepabytes, or heptabytes, or whatever. Um, uh, this, is, this is kind of a dated uh, article. So it says, uh, exploded by 60% to 8 exabytes in 2005 and from 5 exabytes in 2003, according to figures and extrapolations developed by the uh, UCB, University of California, Berkeley, that bastion of conservatism. <laughs> <clears throat> that means that in one year, the world will generate 57,000 times the total of all information in the Library of Congress. That's back in 2005. An exabyte is one with a lot of zeros, or one billion billion. Okay. All human spoken words in history are calculated to be five exabytes. Um, information in magnetic media, such as business digital information, account for more than 90% of this staggering total. Berkeley estimates that global information increases about 30% per year. Ever learning and ever able, ever, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. 
We are, learning, we are learning so much. We have so much access to knowledge. In fact, as we were coming over here, we passed this sign that said, no Melaroos. So one of my boys was asking, what are Melaroos? I, I had a general idea, but I, I couldn't remember. And then I was looking at my wife, and I was like, oh, Google it. Okay? And I, fact, I think the word term Google stands for infinite, correct? Um, at any rate, the, 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 the habit we're in now is, if we don't know something, to just simply Google it, and you'll get more information than you really wanted. Um, online information doubles every six months. So the amount available today will double by the time we get to uh, January or whatever, February, and time passes by in, yeah, exponentially too. So corporate information doubles every 18 months. Scientific information doubles every five years. And, you know, scientific information not always exactly the most credible. Yeah, oppositions of science falsely so called. Um, biological information doubles every five years. Useful genetic information doubles every 18 to 24 months. Something that we, we went through our son is the, the research in genetics. Um, and uh, when William was going through, we were trying to figure out what, what William was having problems with. Uh, the doctor that we see now um, pinpointed that it might be a variance in his genetic code. And now that they have the technology to pursue genetic information and even alter it, um, I, I was speaking with one gentleman who we were setting up, the, we were doing electrical for their, uh, their laboratory, and he was talking about how with the current genetic uh, knowledge that they have, they can begin engineering families. Um, so they're tampering around with something that uh, belongs to God. And uh, so, you know, if you don't want a population of men, you can get rid of all the men. If you don't want a population of women, you can get rid of all the women. You know, it's, it's great. We can just do whatever we want. The sum total of human knowledge doubles every two to three years. I, I don't know if I've experienced that. I don't know if my knowledge is doubling. I think it's, I'm losing my knowledge. Um, and is soon expected to double every year. Okay? Or it's not really talking about what you can capacitate on in your individual mind. But uh, as a general rule, human knowledge doubles every two to three years, and it will double every year. Printed knowledge doubles every eight years. Technical knowledge doubles every three years. Medical knowledge doubles every seven years. Um, each year, around a million books are printed. That's titles, not copies. Okay, so they're not talking about all the copies of those books. We're talking about different titles, different, uh, different books altogether. A million books are printed every year. 25,276 newspapers are published, separate newspaper titles, 40,000 scholarly journals, 80,000 mass market periodicals, and 40,000 newsletters. Estimates based on the Netcraft web server survey for January 2008 show that there are over 155 and a half million distinct websites, an increase of over 33 million from six months before. That was 2008. I think it was 1990 that the first website was invented, and we'll talk about that. And then he concludes this thing, but what good is a head full of knowledge if our hearts are empty and we lack peace of mind and purpose of life? Okay. Um, we should not be guilty of ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Hopefully there's a day in our lives where we realize the truth, we came to uh, um, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we realize our purpose now in Christ. That is the real um, purpose-driven life, if you will. Um, there is a <clears throat> so, so this last article, let me make sure I'm not getting out of my, okay, I'm not getting out of my uh, order, is on the internet and the smartphone. It's underneath the heading, cultural factors that weak are weakening churches. So he says, uh, the great power of television has been eclipsed by that of the internet. Today, you don't need a television to access moral filth. <clears throat> so when he says that television has been eclipsed by that of the internet, um, have, have we maybe noticed in our individual lives, whereas we were once giving our time to the television, now we're giving our time to a computer, uh, whether it be a laptop uh, or a desktop, uh, an iMac or you know, uh, a PC, PC and iMac, that's what they call them, right? Okay. Um, and smartphones, okay? Um, 
It was the internet beginning in the 1990s and the smartphone beginning especially in 2007 with the introduction of the iPhone that have made the world and apostasy all intrusive. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge gateway. Um, and I've talked about the fact that, you know, as um, particularly as parents, but as believers, we have to minimize portals, gates, whatever, whatever uh, passageways that can get into our hearts and minds or into our families. We have to minimize that. We have to guard it. We have to, to put shackles on that. Uh, the Internet and smartphones are, are an example of this. Um, television is, a, is an example of that. If you're going to choose to have a, a television in your household, if you're going to choose to have the internet or a smartphone, you're going to have to seek ways to constrain it because it is a beast that will destroy you. Um, no church today can escape the effect of this technology uh, from cities of wealthy nations to the village of third world nation, countries. Have you ever seen these images of like uh, these third world countries that are really impoverished and out on the, the remotest deserts there might be this little shack but inside this shack there's this glowing orb just like you know you see these flashings of lights it's television because irrespective of of how poverty stricken we are television's important um, it's our it's our access to the world um, in the internet slash smartphone generation church young people can access the pop culture again pop culture is popular culture Okay, and it's not necessarily something that we are supposed to be a part of. Uh, there are things that are, that are popular in our culture that are not necessarily bad, um, but a good percentage of popular culture is something we should keep a weary eye of and not necessarily follow. Uh, church people, and, and he's, you know, the characterization of this is that it's just at the touch of a finger. All you've got to do, boom, and you're there. It's just as easy as that. Um, I think one of the probably unrealized blessings of smartphones is that with digitization of information, the necessity of having printed, uh, um, printed, um, well, printed regulars, but I'm, I'm thinking, or like printed magazines that used to be sold in various locations are no longer really, I don't really see them anymore. Uh, so you don't have to have them in your face. Uh, not to say that they're not printed anymore, but it's just that I think um, people have begun to realize the power of, of the media and the digitization, uh, so the printed page has become less desirable. It's, you know, it's no longer marketable. Um, church people can connect with any songwriter and be influenced by his or her music, philosophy, and lifestyles, and again, the Bible warns us that filthy corrupt communications corrupt good manners. Um, so we have to be careful about what we're hearing, what we're seeing, um, that we don't become corrupted by it, uh, that we don't become drawn away and spoiled by the philosophies of this world. Um, we don't want to be taken over to their side. Uh, we don't want our families weeping because um, we've been subjected to these um, uh, heretical ideas uh, or corrupt philosophies and we've been won over by them and we've departed from the truth. Um, church women can be influenced by popular evangelical teachers such as Beth Moore. How many, uh, how many have heard Beth Moore's name? Okay, Very popular uh, teacher. I think she is within the Southern Baptist Convention. An interesting article where she takes up a fight against a, uh, a professor kind of asserting, uh, I think it's kind of arguing for uh, the ability of women to preach, and we know that's not biblical. Right. Right. She's very influential, and uh, uh, very influential and prolific writer. Um, but we shouldn't, uh, you know, I kind of lump her in with a, a much of the things that come out of Christian bookstores. You're not going to find a whole lot of independent Baptist ideology or thinking, if you will, in Christian bookstores. In fact, you're not going to find a lot of Christian bookstores anymore because they're closing down because of, you know, the Internet and, and dig, the digital age. Um, interesting that you began to see Catholic doctrine and Catholic practicing creeping into Christian bookstores uh, before, you know, this one down here next to the mall. Yeah, I mean, you go into that and you never saw it, but then all of a sudden now you're, you're seeing like rosary and a, and a complete section of Catholicism, and that's just... 
that's just again that whole unifying and, and uh, the ecumenical type of idea that we all need to get together. Um, false churches, teachers, and preachers influence men, and they can influence preachers. I mean, there's been plenty of preachers, I, I would imagine, um, that have been drawn away from things that they've heard, seen, listened to on the internet. Um, <clears throat> the uh, The amount of time spent searching internet, uh, the internet averages to 24 hours a week. Uh, the amount of time spent uh, on social media daily is two plus hours. Um, the average person spends four hours a day on their phone. Okay, um, when it was a dumb phone, there was no need to spend four hours a day on it. They used to have like these texting competitions where these kids could text messages on these little keyboards. I've got one of those old phones. Um, I can't text very fast on it. And I resisted texting initially when it came out because uh, I just don't like advancements in technology necessarily. No, I just would rather talk to a person. And you know, I was even talking to my wife about this on the way over. A lot of times when you shoot a text, there's really no context to it. You, you really, it, the tone behind the text can come across wrong, and so you're, you're at a lack, and you, you might presume, hey, is this person angry at me or something? Um, you have to, be, have to be very careful the way we communicate on texting. Um, but people are on social media, they're on Facebook, I mean, uh, Instagram, the, they're, they're shopping online, they're using, they're using the internet for, for everything in their life. Um, even fast food is not fast enough. We can now go to, what's that fast food place now, a grab and go or something like that. You can call and you, they'll bring the fast food to you yeah. because the fast food's not fast enough, I guess. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> the internet, uh, now the, the, the technology behind the internet has been advancing since the early, like the mid-century, I think it was the 50s or 60s, when they started trying to do networking. Um, DARPA. I'm sorry? DARPA. DARPA? Yeah, they were the first okay. Um, but they were producing the first ability to transmit information on, on networks and things like that. And then in, it says in the 1980s, research at CERN, C-E-R-N, which is the Council European, and I can't pronounce research in, in French, so I'll just say research, uh, but it's, it, was, it was for nuclear research. And what they're essentially doing is they're smashing atoms and they're, they're probably looking at time travel. What other kind of benefits they can reap from, from building this big ring in the ground and... and uh, they're trying to send it around to have it arrive to a Okay. So it's called the Halon Collider, but anyways, the necessity of of getting information uh, and collaboration, uh, there was a gentleman that produced uh, the World Wide Web, as we know it today, uh, for the ability to pass information, to transmit information, and so that, that would facilitate that. And then since then, um, the, wor the World Wide Web has uh, been growing. Um, it says, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, result, uh, computer science Tim Berners-Lee, uh, invented the World Wide Web, linking hypertext documents into an information system accessible from any node on the network. Since the mid-1990s, the internet has had a revolutionary impact on culture, commerce, and technology, including the rise of near-instant communication by electronic mail, instant messaging, voice over internet protocol, telephone calls, two-way interactive video calls, and the World Wide Web, with its discussion forums, blogs, social networking, and online shopping sites. The research and education community continues to develop <clears throat> and use advanced networks such as Janet in the United Kingdom and Internet2 in the United States. Increasing amounts of data are transmitted at higher and higher speeds over fiber optic networks operating at 1 gigabytes per second to 2 gigabyte or 10 gigabytes per second or more. The Internet's takeover of the global, communica global communication landscape was almost instant in historical terms. You may have recalled hearing in news where in dealing with some of these uh, more totalitarian governments, when uh, things are going bad for them, they shut down the internet. They try to re repress communication. Um, so 
uh, the, the globalization or, or the, the use of the internet to communicate across. I mean, they have these things called flash mobs and, and different things like that where communication can be spread very quickly and groups of people can, can show up on and protest or do whatever, uh, play instruments, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Uh, let's say the internet's takeover of the global communication landscape was almost instant in historical terms It only communicated 1% of information flowing through two-way te telecommunication networks in the year 1993 I would I would assume that meant uh, landlines dial-up Probably if you still have dial-up good on you um, And then it increased from 1% in 1993 to 51% by 2000 so that's just in seven years Okay 51 half of the half the communications and more than 97% of the telecommunicated information by 2007. So it's just growing in leaps and bounds. Okay, that's the influence of this, of this medium. Today, the internet continues to grow, driven by ever, ever greater amounts of online information, commerce, entertainment, and social networking. However, the future of the global internet may be shaped by regional differences in the world. Okay, so um, it's a giant, and it truly has eclipsed television and we spent a couple of weeks on television and, and the importance of uh, realizing what the, the danger it is. Um, but this is information on demand. And so we have to be very careful with it, how we use it. Um, now, this, this is a fairly short article. Um, there is obviously good to be had from the internet, okay? Um, a lot of the research I do um, in preparing Sunday school lessons, I just, I, I take my wife's phone, put the, whatever the, hotspot, okay, on and um, utilize that uh, to do research. Brother Cloud, who did this article, uses the internet extensively. Um, there are many preachers who keep blogs that use, you have to ha use the internet to, to access those things. So there's uh, good that can be, that can come of it, but, um, you have to utilize it in a way, oh, uh, you're not getting out early. Um, you have to utilize it in a way so that it's not gonna damage you um, and that you, you have accountability to it. Um, and and there's, there's software and there's all sorts of things that are out there for um, uh, that purpose. Um, so that kind of, that's it. That's it for that article. We're back into Matthew next week, um, we're gonna, jump back in where we left off with um, King Josiah rediscovering the Word of God and revival breaking out, um, and then we'll find our way back to Matthew. You are dismissed.